recovering Elizabeth of York proved to be a successful project. So I guess it's time to talk about her mother, Elizabeth Woodville. As this is a video format, you're not seeing the way I'm spelling her last name. There are many ways of doing so, thanks to there being no official spelling rules before the end of the 16th century. I'd like to spell it Woodville with a Y, because it looks more authentically medieval. Plain old Woodville in its modern spelling loses its magic when you read it on paper. I define the medieval era to be between the Norman Conquest and the Battle of Bosworth Field, the time beforehand after the departure of the Romans and the constant Viking invasions being the Anglo-Saxon era. In those 400 years, England saw a handful of influential queens who stepped out of their bubbles and used restrictions to their advantage. Elizabeth Woodville was the last Queen of England to do so before the Tudor era. Sorry, Anne Neville. Not only was she not born for the task of being Queen, but she served as consort to a man who had been an enemy. She was one of the most contentious figures in the Wars of the Roses, which was impressive in and of itself, seeing as both Marguerite of Anjou and Richard III both played major parts in it. Let's meet the penultimate Plantagenet Queen, Elizabeth Woodville. I may be repeating a lot of what I've said in the Elizabeth York and Richard III videos here, and once again we have countless figures who share the same three names, including the women. Elizabeth Woodville was believed to have been born in Northamptonshire in 1437, this being a time before common people's births and deaths were recorded. Her exact date of birth is unknown. Even before she was born, Elizabeth's family was controversial. Her parents, Richard Woodville and Jaquetta of Luxembourg, were an unlikely match. Jaquetta was initially married to the Duke of Bedford, John of Lancaster. The Duke was in his 40s and Jaquetta was 17. After two years of marriage, Jaquetta was widowed and childless. She had lightly fallen in love with Richard Woodville when he escorted her from Luxembourg to England in 1433. They married in secret without receiving King Henry VI's permission and they were fined a thousand pounds when they were found out. Elizabeth was the first of 14 children between Jaquetta and Richard, consisting of eight daughters and six sons. Their first son, Louis, would be the only one to not survive infancy. Elizabeth's upbringing would have been that of a typical English lady, anticipating a good match when the time came. As the eldest daughter, many hopes rested on her marriage to influence the chances of her sisters, and she would have been required to mother her younger siblings as well. While the Woodville family was not considered noble, they were wealthy so they could easily buy some good matches. Aged 15, Elizabeth married Sir John Grey of Groby. This was in 1452, three years before the Wars of the Roses began. John, believed to have been a year older than his bride, was the son of Elizabeth Ferrers, Baroness of Groby in her own right, and Edward Grey, heir to a barony of his own. John would be the great-great-grandfather of Lady Jane Grey. Not much is known about what their marriage was like, although they managed to have two sons together, Thomas and Richard. He inherited his father's title in 1457. They were on the Lancastrian side when the Wars of the Roses began. John would go on to fight in the Second Battle of St Albans in 1461, where he was struck down and killed. The widowed Elizabeth is believed to have returned to her family home in Northamptonshire with her two sons. She wanted to secure their inheritance as the Lancastrians were defeated and the Yorkist Edward IV took the throne. Fearing her late husband would be considered a traitor and all the lands and monies belonging to the Greys would be confiscated. Legend has it that Elizabeth waited under a tree for the king to pass by and present her case, though it is more likely she used her family's money to get to court and used King Edward's keenness for pretty women to approach him. Though she was five years his senior, the king was taken with her. He initially wanted her to be his mistress, which she refused. He then offered her marriage, which she accepted, and they had a secret wedding in 1464. For a while, the marriage was secret. Edward's friend and advisor, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, wanted to secure a French marriage alliance. Nonetheless, Edward IV declared his marriage publicly and summoned his wife and her family to court. The scandal was heated 
to put it lightly. Not only was Elizabeth from the Lancastrian faction, but she was a commoner. Kings just did not marry commoners. Their position was designed to marry a foreign princess in order to form alliances. What's more, Edward had already pulled this marriage trick on another woman, Eleanor Talbot, with whom he'd had an illegitimate son before she withdrew into a nunnery. It may have been that Elizabeth, already with two healthy sons, seemed Edward's best option to gain a son and heir of his own as soon as possible, rather than wait around for Warwick to make an alliance. Elizabeth was crowned in May 1465. She gave birth to her first daughter, Elizabeth of York, in 1466, the first of ten children between her and Edward. As queen, Elizabeth brought her family a lot of influence, and her siblings were married off to various noble families, including the youngest daughter, Catherine, to Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, when they were both still children. Elizabeth had had three daughters, Elizabeth, Mary and Cecily, when Warwick and Edward's younger brother George, Duke of Clarence, rebelled against their king. Edward was briefly captured while Elizabeth and her children took refuge in the tower. Richard Woodville and his second son John were executed at Kenilworth Castle. The dispute did not last long as Parliament did not back George's claim to the crown and Edward was released. In 1470, Elizabeth was pregnant with her fourth child when Warwick and Clarence once again rebelled by going to France to side with her predecessor, Marguerite de Anjou. They returned with an army. Edward fled with his youngest brother Richard of Gloucester, while Elizabeth and her children fled the Tower of London to Westminster Abbey to seek sanctuary. It was here that she gave birth to a son, another Edward, in November of that year. King Edward returned to England to reclaim his throne and defeated Warwick in the Battle of Barnet, with Clarence now returned to his brother's side. They marched west to confront Queen Marguerite, whom they defeated at the Battle of Tewkesbury. Edward, now undisputed king, held power until his death in 1483. During this time, Elizabeth and Edward had six more children, though Mary died in 1482 and George and Margaret died in infancy. This left seven surviving children, with the last, Bridget, being born in 1480. While Marguerite Anjou founded the Queen's College, Cambridge, Elizabeth became a secondary founder and patronised the college, as well as being the archetypal religious queen of the medieval period. Edward IV's death came suddenly in April 1483 after a fishing trip. He had just enough foresight on his deathbed to appoint a regent for his 12-year-old son. Elizabeth presumably thought her oldest surviving brother Anthony, 2nd Earl Rivers, would be given this role. Instead, Edward named his brother the Duke of Gloucester, who had spent the majority of his brother's reign in the north securing the border against the Scots. With Gloucester still on his way south, Elizabeth sought to secure her son first, and sent Antony and her second son from her first marriage, Richard Grey, to collect the prince from Ludlow Castle on the Welsh border. Gloucester, with the help of the Duke of Buckingham, managed to apprehend Rivers and Grey, imprisoning them in Pontefract Castle, while escorting King Edward V to the Tower of London, from which he would never leave. Elizabeth received word of her failing coup, and once again retreated to Westminster Abbey to seek sanctuary with her younger surviving son, Richard of Shrewsbury. Gloucester would manage to secure the young Shrewsbury and bring him to the tower as well. Bit by bit, news would be brought to the Queen Dowager that her marriage to Edward IV was found to be invalid, owing to his previous union with Eleanor Talbot, which made all her children illegitimate. This left Gloucester to overthrow his nephew and be named King Richard III. Not only that, but her brother and son had been beheaded at Pontefract. Elizabeth and her daughters were still in sanctuary while Richard III was crowned. Not long after, she received word that her two sons by Edward had gone missing in the tower. In order to overthrow Richard III, Elizabeth joined with Buckingham and Margaret Beaufort, mother to the last Lancastrian heir, Henry Tudor, with the intention of marrying her eldest daughter to Henry when he became king. Buckingham's rebellion failed, and Elizabeth's lands were stripped from her. King Richard managed to negotiate clemency with her in March 1484, where she and her daughters could leave sanctuary and come to court. Before the Battle of Bosworth Field, Elizabeth's daughters, along with the young Earl of Warwick and his sister Margaret, were moved to Sheriff Hutton Castle in Yorkshire. Richard III was defeated in August 1485, and Henry VII became king. The order declaring her children's illegitimacy was revoked and destroyed, and Elizabeth was once again recognised as a Queen Dowager. <laughs> 
Elizabeth would see her daughter marry Henry the Seventh in 1486 and be there for the birth of her grandchild, Arthur, Prince of Wales. However, early in 1487, she would mark her official retirement from the court and withdraw to Bermondsey Abbey in Southwark. It isn't known if she went willingly. There was some speculation as to whether it was forced on her because she allied herself with the Lambert Simnor Rebellion, which would be a really dumb move on her part seeing as her daughter was now Queen of England with a son. Henry considered his mother-in-law for the hand of the Scottish King James III, but this very quickly fell through when he was killed in battle in 1488. She was allowed to return for the births of her next two grandchildren, Margaret Tudor and Henry Duke of York. Queen Elizabeth would visit her mother regularly, as well as her other daughters. Her sole surviving son, Thomas Grey, was made Marquis of Dorset under his stepfather's reign and had 14 children with his second wife before he passed away in 1501. Before she died, Elizabeth wrote in her will that she wanted a simple funeral. She passed away on the 8th of June, 1492, age 55. And if you want a bit of trivia there, that was about two months before Christopher Columbus started his first voyage across the Atlantic. Henry VII acquiesced to his mother-in-law's request for a simple funeral where all her daughters, save for Queen Elizabeth, who was in confinement, attended. Some contemporary onlookers interpreted it as a prime example of the king's miserly nature, not wishing to go all out on a royal funeral. Elizabeth Woodville's exact cause of death is unknown, but a letter from the Venetian ambassador, written in 1511, speculates that plague might have been the cause. Her body was taken to St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, where she was buried in the North Choir Isle, alongside King Edward IV. I'm William Shakespeare. I write plays and I make stuff up. If I wrote it how it was in real life, it would be rubbish and boring, like school. Unlike her daughter, Elizabeth Woodville appears in not one, but two plays in the Henriad. In Henry VI Part Three, she has already arrived at court and appealed to Edward for her husband's lands in Act Three, Scene Two. Edward debates with his brothers on if he should grant them to her. Gloucester tells his brother it would be the honourable thing to do, but aside to Clarence, they both acknowledge that their brother will only grant her request if she gives something in return. They're correct, as Edward coyly tries to entice Elizabeth. She replies with the line, I know I am too mean to be your queen, and yet too good to be your concubine. Edward decides to marry her, much to the chagrin of Clarence when he and Gloucester hear the news. Everyone withdraws, except for Gloucester, who muses on the flaws of both his brothers. In a sense, Edward's desire to marry Elizabeth, defy Warwick and drive Clarence away, is the catalyst for him to begin pursuing the crown for himself. The timeline is rather condensed, so the rest of the play sums up several years' worth of events in the last two and a half acts of the play. Warwick and Clarence's disobedience is condensed into them meeting up in France and joining with Queen Margaret. Elizabeth briefly appears after she has become queen, as well as hearing news of Edward's capture by Warwick. By the end of the play, she has already given birth to the future Edward V. In Richard III, Elizabeth is one of his main foils. Richard sees her and the rest of her family as an obstacle keeping him from power. She is one of a handful of people who sees Richard's villainy for what it truly is and sees through his charismatic persona. Richard frames her family for plotting Clarence's murder behind Edward's back. After Edward dies and she hears Richard has captured Rivers and Richard Grey, she retreats with Shrewsbury to Sanctuary, but the scene of her handing him over isn't seen. Most adaptations exclude Queen Margaret from Richard III, but her presence in it shows Elizabeth how, once they were rivals, they are now in the same boat. Her final scene in the Henriad is when she and Richard's mother confront him before he leaves for Bosworth Field. Duchess Cecily curses her son before he and Elizabeth are left alone. He states his wish to marry her daughter and sire and heir, seeing as he is confident he will defeat Richmond as he has defeated everyone who wanted his throne until now. She is more than a little uncomfortable at marrying her daughter to an uncle, as well as the man who murdered her sons and brother. But he tells her to talk her daughter round. She leaves, saying she will think it over. But once she is gone, it is clear that Richard would have had her killed as well the moment he won the battle. She is the sad queen who's lost her sons, one of Richard's biggest victims, and it's worse for her because she's left alive to grieve the loss of those whom Richard has killed. I find that the sole adaptation that really played with Elizabeth and her family was the Sir Ian McKellen movie from 1995, where she is played by Annette Bening. Both she and Rivers, who is played by Robert Downey Jr. here, 
are the only American actors in the film. And by the way, as a side note, I didn't get to mention this in the Richard III hot takes, Sir Ian specifically wanted Robert Downey Jr., but he wasn't sure if he was going to accept the role, but once his agent said, hey, Sir Ian McKellen wants you for a movie, Robert Downey Jr. just dropped everything and flew over to England to help out. <laughs> Not only does having American Woodvilles play into the idea that their clan are rich social climbers, but with the 1930s setting, it does have real-world connotations. Edward VIII became king in 1936. And before the year ended, he'd abdicated because he wasn't allowed to marry the American Wallace Simpson. And it wasn't because she was American, it was because she was divorced. And that was a big no-no back then. And I think it was the taboo of marrying a divorced woman that stopped Charles from marrying Camilla, so he married Diana, and look how well that turned out. I don't think they really care anymore. But in the case of Edward VIII, it was probably a good thing that he abdicated because he was weak-willed and Wallace Simpson was a Nazi sympathiser. Nonetheless, it's an interesting interpretation and it shows that they used the new setting and time period to build up the world they created. Far too many times I see Shakespearean plays just put in a modern setting and they don't play with the aesthetic. Oh, now, what am I to do with these? It's not as though Margaret of Anjou will return for them. I never thought it would be me doing this. You are Queen of England now, and you will never make the same mistakes that she did. It is my hope that your closeness to your daughter will speed your return to health. Thank you for your kindness. I will visit you later. I want to state clearly here that Yes, I am not a fan of Philippa Gregory's works. Well, mostly her fiction books. Recently she has published a non-fiction book about forgotten women in history, and it's actually quite fascinating. I have nothing against her as a person. I used to think nothing of her, albeit wondering what the incest fixation was all about, but it's kind of like a Joel Schumacher situation at this point. She's a good person, really, and I imagine she's very nice to talk to, and she's also not a turf, which I think is the bare minimum we can expect from our authors at this point. And when she earns money from her works, she donates part of it to good causes, including to the starving children, that the current government, although they probably won't be current for much longer, repeatedly ignored. Sometimes you can separate the art from the artist because you appreciate the person and not the work, even though most people separate the art from the artist because they like the work and not the person. I suppose we can hate the sin, love the sinner, after all. Anyway, the Stars Gregory verse is the one instance that actually lets Elizabeth be a major player in the plot, as opposed to a tragic, powerless figure. Let's talk about the White Queen first. Elizabeth, played by Rebecca Ferguson in the role that made her career, begins the story in the wake of her first husband's death, seeking Edward IV's mercy, and ends just after Bosworth Field. I always thought the White Queen to be the better of the three Gregory Stars series, although it wasn't hard to put it in that place, given the rapid decline in quality in the following two series. To me, the whole Gregory verse peaked in episode 7 of The White Queen, before it became a haven of incest and character assassination. Ferguson's performance definitely carries the series, as she remains a consistent character where she learns how to play both sides, not fully siding with either the Tudors or the Plantagenets in the final episodes. Unlike the other two series, Elizabeth fights using only words, influence and money. At no point is she going to don a suit of armour and go charging into Bosworth Field against Richard. Though underestimated, a woman could have a place in the quote-unquote Game of Thrones. Obviously, the whole Gregory verse was created in response to the popularity of Game of Thrones, where they went and cast a handful of actors from that series to appear here. In The White Princess, she's played by Essie Davis, who played Lady Crane in season 6, aka the woman who was a pantomime version of Circe, and I believe that's what caused her to be cast in The White Princess. While The White Queen made Elizabeth into the protagonist, with other fleshed out characters to work against her, showing that neither side was truly good or evil, with the exception of Margaret Beaufort who was just cray cray all the way through, The White Princess really loves to glorify the baddies, and characters' allegiances change not because the story has naturally resulted in it, but because this is what the plot requires. Watching both series back to back as I did is much like binging Game of Thrones where you think, wow, this is pretty good, and then it just declines, like a wheelchair off a cliff. 
despite being mother to the new protagonist. By the way, we're just going to have to distinguish between both Elizabeths here. When I say Elizabeth, I mean Elizabeth Woodville, and when I say Lizzie, I mean Elizabeth of York. Elizabeth is hell-bent on ruining everything. Obviously, this harkens back to a plot point from The White Queen, where rather than hand Shrewsbury over to Richard, she switched him out with a body double and sent the real Shrewsbury overseas. For some reason, he returns to his mother just before Bosworth, and they have to hide him in the attic. He assumes the name Perkin Warbeck in reference to a pet name his mother made up for him only in that opening scene. What the hell is a Perkin, anyway? Unless she was referring to Parkin. I love Parkin. And yes, Elizabeth wants revenge against Margaret Beaufort for killing Edward V. Long story. But her plan would involve using her daughter and throwing her under a hay cart, as well as all her children. So, rather than have her daughter be queen and satisfied with that victory, She's planning on overthrowing the Tudors with Shrewsbury Warbeck. So I guess her daughter and her grandchildren can just go and do one. Despite the number of times Lizzie tries to mitigate peace between the Tudors and her mother, Elizabeth keeps ruining it by being treasonous as hell. She eventually passes away, leaving Lizzie to deal with the fallout of Warbeck's rebellion. And that's not even getting into the whole witchcraft subplot. This is a long-running narrative where Jakarta, Elizabeth and Lizzie use their supposed ancestry to Melusina in order to bend events to their will. In The White Queen, they don't cast any doubt on the magic being real, since every curse and prediction comes true, including Elizabeth's marriage to Edward IV, having a son, making a storm the English Channel, sabotaging Buckingham's rebellion, and cursing both Warwick and Clarence to die violent deaths. After the supposed deaths of the princes in the Tower, Elizabeth and Lizzie curse the murderers to lose the male heirs to their house. This sharing of magical abilities and visions through the water is only shared with the elder daughters, so I guess the other daughters just aren't special enough. This carries over into the White Princess, as Elizabeth continues to use witchcraft to mess with the Tudors, including using Mandrake Root to taunt Margaret Beaufort with Shrewsbury still being alive. Lizzie doesn't appear to share these magical secrets with her daughters, however, but the male heir curse carries through several of Philippa Gregory's novels. Lizzie and Elizabeth finally have a discussion as to whether the magic is just real or coincidence, and Lizzie sees her brother executed, hoping that the curse was never real in the first place. As I have not read any of the novels that were adapted into the Gregory verse, and I don't really plan to either, I believe that there was more and more departure from the source material as things progressed, from the White Princess into the Spanish Princess. At least Elizabeth remained consistent in this series that made her the main character, a mother looking out for the well-being of her children and fighting for their safety, even if she can't raise a sword to do so. I've made many requests in the past. I'm here before you because I've yet to be granted an audience. Interesting. Your courage is a true marvel. What is your name? My name is Elizabeth Woodville, Your Majesty. This is probably the most unique Elizabeth among the small list we have. I talked a lot about how different the characters were in the anime with their historical counterparts, but I didn't talk about the Woodville faction. Elizabeth first appears in Episode 3, approaching Edward as she did in the play, and Edward later coerces Richard to help him hide his affair with Elizabeth until they are secretly married. Unbeknownst to Richard and Edward, she is not entering this marriage for love. She is playing the long game to get revenge on the Yorkists for her first husband's death. Only her and Antony know this scheme. Her plan is to have a prince and rule through him. The intention was clearly to make Elizabeth an antagonistic character against Richard's more sympathetic one. As a result, you don't feel as bad for her when Richard disinherits her children and takes over. The rest of the faction, including the two princes and the children from her first marriage, are shown to be much more ignorant, bratty and superficial than Richard and his allies. The original dub has Elizabeth, voiced by Shizuka Ito, whom I recognise solely as Sailor Venus from Sailor Moon Crystal. And in the English dub, she is voiced by Susie Young, who also played Makima in Chainsaw Man, which I have not watched. I'm still mad at Mappa for screwing me over on Yuri on Ice. Elizabeth has to show two personas, the archetypal queenly figure and her true self, who speaks with unrestrained glee at getting her revenge. She puts so much of her hopes into her sons that she forgets all about her daughter. Oh, that's another thing. The number of children she and Edward have had is whittled down to three, which is fair because it's easier to have a handful of extras on a set than it is to animate a bunch of characters who 
To be honest, don't put too much impact on the plot. And I didn't know of the existence of this anime when I made the Elizabeth of York video. I felt a little annoyed that it had slipped my notice. But I'll talk about Elizabeth, sorry, Beth of York. And to be honest, I feel that she's an early plot arc that never got used or completed. Much like with the White Queen, she isn't fond of being used for the ambitions of others. And she even attempts to make the moves on Richard, but he doesn't appear to be interested in her. After which she is last seen having married Henry Tudor before Bosworth Field. Elizabeth Woodville herself also disappears from the narrative not long after agreeing to marry her daughter to Henry Tudor. This was a strange interpretation, especially given the fact that in order to give Richard more sympathy, it comes at the expense of making his enemies look almost cartoonishly evil. Just wait until I talk about Henry VII. <sighs> Majesty is overwrought. Overwrought? Oh no, I'm not. Once before I was forced to seek safety within the walls of the church. My eldest son, the king, was born in sanctuary in this very building. You see, this is not my first experience. The Woodville Crest. You accuse my name? You accuse your queen? I accuse only this dagger and the hand that wielded it, your majesty. This will be a bitter moment for Edward to take to his grave. There were two movies about Richard III's rise and fall called The Tower of London. The first, from 1939, had Elizabeth Woodville played by Barbara O'Neill, also known as the mother of Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. Meanwhile, the second movie, from 1962, a Roger Corman-Vincent Price collaboration, had her played by Sarah Selby. Both queens have similar character arcs where they lose their husbands and sons and are forced to weep over their losses. Considering the first movie came out at the beginning of the Second World War, I can imagine the emotional strain Elizabeth Park would have had for the mothers and wives in the audience. I believe the 1939 movie had the better and more complex interpretation, mostly because it covers a longer span of time and covers the actions of characters other than Richard. Whereas in the 1962 film, Richard is the main focus and there are only a handful of scenes of other characters reacting to his actions. Several scenes in the 1939 movie have Elizabeth interacting with her children, taking part in their everyday life and getting a maternal instinct of dread when she sees Richard standing over her sleeping sons. She recognises something malicious about him, but for now is too vague to understand what. Her maternal instincts carry through the rest of the film to the point where she actually senses when her sons have been murdered. And I believe there is a chase scene in one of the movies where they try to escape through the tunnels under the tower, but a portcullis comes down, separating Elizabeth from one of her sons. Elizabeth also sponsors the theft of the treasury in the 1939 film, for which Richard retaliates by killing the princes, getting at her psychologically rather than physically, since she is still in sanctuary. Other than that, she serves mostly as an emotional victim of Richard's cruelty much like in the Shakespeare play. I believe also that neither film shows any further scenes with her before Richard is defeated. He's killed her sons, she served her purpose. As she's stuck in sanctuary, she can't move physically against him and has to depend on her lady-in-waiting and the lady-in-waiting's fiance to carry out all of her plans. They're both okay interpretations, given that Elizabeth herself is literally limited during Richard's brief reign. Maybe if they brought Margaret Beaufort into it, she would have had more to do. But I can't expect two male-dominated movies to give female characters more agency than the plot requires of them. My royal sons! Or have you all forgotten? were sent to that place for their own safety. My babies of blessed memory. They went to the tower and they never came out, not even dead. That's enough, woman. And finally, we have The Shadow of the Tower, the prequel to The Six Wives of Henry VIII and Elizabeth R. It is the lesser known of the three series. Copies are very hard to find and whatever uploads you can get on YouTube are incomplete. Here, Elizabeth is played by Stephanie Bidmead, she appears in only one of 12 episodes. Henry VII is in a meeting with the Privy Council, when she storms in with her only remaining son Dorset trailing behind her. She is incensed at the idea of being sent away from court, and, clearly traumatised from losing her sons, is mostly insulted that she will be able to see the tower from Bermondsey Abbey, and 
Cross-referencing it, yes, you probably absolutely would at that point in history. Granted, the real Bermondsey Abbey isn't there anymore, thank you, Henry VIII, but I imagine is Bermondsey Abbey where Abbey Road Bridge is? Because if so, then the tower is literally just on the other side of the Tower Bridge, and she would have at least been able to see the top of the White Tower, if not the high walls that separated her from her sons. She fears that Henry is trying to do away with her, and or taunt her. Dorset weakly backs up his mother, and Henry tells her to take pleasure in at least one of her sons being alive, and she leaves him with an ominous warning. Crowns are dear in England, son-in-law, but heads are cheap that wear them. And that's the last we see of her. Henry banishes his mother-in-law much sooner than historically recorded, and I don't see why we couldn't have had more scenes with her given that there are plenty of episodes with Elizabeth of York where she could have appeared. I mean, you had 12 episodes, so you could have done something. There hasn't been much debate surrounding Elizabeth Woodville's appearance. She was considered beautiful at the time, and it was lightly a mix of her beauty and wit that caught Edward IV's eye and convinced him to make her his queen. The portrait best associated with her shows her in typical late medieval dress where her hair is only partially visible. She appears to have either had red or blonde hair. If her hair was red, this explains how Elizabeth of York got her red hair, which was then passed down to Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. However, if not, there was probably another red-haired descendant of Elizabeth or Edward IV who passed the gene down. As red hair is a recessive gene, it can be carried in one's DNA, while not showing itself on the surface. The portrait was made posthumously, however, in the 16th century, but may have been copied from an original. Like with Elizabeth of York, her on-screen depictions typically show her as blonde. It isn't too difficult to wonder why, as she is the White Queen, and that implies her appearance would have been as pale as possible to contrast the Lancastrians, even though she started out as a Lancastrian. But with the addition of her beauty being one of the best known things about her, being blonde is habitually used to emphasise feminine beauty, especially at this point in time. Her portrait was copied several times, and you can find separate versions of them all over the place. Other artworks depicting Elizabeth Woodville are only done in the typical medieval style where there is little realism. As a result, Elizabeth Woodville's true face will always be a mystery. However, I don't think she would have been as thin as her portrait suggests, given that she did have 12 children. It is true that England and Great Britain would not have been the same if Edward IV had not married Elizabeth Woodville. For one thing, Henry VIII would never have been born, and we may never have had the Reformation. Her history is full of what-ifs. What if Elizabeth of York had been a boy, and thus determined old enough to rule by themselves upon Edward IV's death? What if the brief resurgence of Henry VI was successful? What if Richard III had won the Battle of Bosworth Field? And more to the point, why did Edward defy Warwick and marry a commoner instead of taking part in a foreign alliance? There are many ways to answer this question. Edward IV had mostly gotten his throne via the Earl of Warwick's influence, and his decision to marry against Warwick's wishes was probably Edward clapping back at what he might have seen as Warwick trying to demonstrate total control over English politics, and Edward didn't want to be a puppet. But at the same time, Edward was really bad at settling into personal conflict, and probably thought this whole thing would blow over. He's like the host of a Thanksgiving dinner who wants civility amongst the guests, despite one half of the family being queer and the other half bragging about where they were on January 6th. Performative civility is not a useful resolution. He kept letting Clarence and Warwick off the hook and they defied him one too many times, purely because they thought he'd made a mistake in marrying Elizabeth. And yet, Edward did nothing to stop the Woodville faction from sinking their teeth into higher statuses, making them feel entitled to the role of protector when he died. The perceived nepotism caused much conflict, and even threatened to see Gloucester, who was very competent and well-respected at the time, cut out of the royal family's business. It could be that Elizabeth and her family became too selfish for power, and Richard III felt compelled to destroy them. And there's one more thing I've been neglecting to mention. The parentage of Edward IV. Was he truly his father's son, or was he illegitimate? The story goes that Cecily of York had an affair with an archer while Richard of York was overseas. 
As a result, York couldn't possibly have been there to conceive his son. If so, this means the descent of the English royal family, from Elizabeth of York right down to Charles III today, has all been based on a lie. Although, let's be real here, all monarchy is based on a lie. This is also perpetuated by the fact that recordings of Edward IV's appearance, tall and fair, was very different to York, who was shorter with dark hair. However, Clarence also shared his older brother's features, while Richard ended up looking more like his father. Once again, we have to factor genetics into this. Which ones a child inherits from their parents is completely random, though statistically the dominant genes of the darker hair and darker eyes usually wins. And as for Duchess Cecily's pregnancy, what you must understand is that no one experiences pregnancy the same way. I can attest to this because I was three weeks late, while my sister was born alarmingly early. So, given this time period where Cecily was supposed to have conceived Edward might have actually been completely wrong and either she conceived Edward just before Richard of York left or conceived him just after he arrived and Edward himself may have been late or premature. And it was because of Cecily's disapproval of her son's match to Elizabeth that she brought this rumour up and threatened to denounce her oldest son as a bastard. And to be honest that's really all we have for this. Marguerite d'Anjou held on to this rumour and tried to perpetuate it. But the thing is, Cecily disapproved so much because she was from the House of Neville, like Warwick, and she shared his disdain for the upstart Woodvilles and would have wished to say anything to intimidate her new daughter-in-law. This rumour was held in reserve for Clarence and Warwick's first act of defiance in order to put Clarence on the throne. But again, Edward was probably too influential and competent in battle for anyone to really believe that the weak-willed and disobedient Clarence would be a viable replacement. As strange as the conspiracy theory is, and how bloody hilarious it would be that for centuries common blood has run in the veins of everyone who has sat on the English throne, it will always be a theory because I highly doubt the royal family is going to want the vaults of St George's Chapel opened just so they can run a DNA test. Above all this, Elizabeth Woodville set the precedent that commoners could become royal. It wouldn't be until Henry VIII married Anne Boleyn that this would happen again, four times. Had Elizabeth I had her way, she might have married Robert Dudley. And since the 1930s, our royal family has been more free to marry whomever they choose, regardless of social status. Another screen queen done. This wasn't exactly a ranking situation because I couldn't decide who was better and who was worse. It should have gone to Shadow of the Tower if they'd given her more to do. Elizabeth Woodville remains one of English history's underrated queens. I'd say she survived more hardships than most of the queens we've seen, with the exception of Henry VIII's wives. She was a keen demonstrator of the philosophy, they knock you down seven times, get up eight. I'm sorry I didn't make any Dune references in regards to Rebecca Ferguson. I just wasn't able to think of any. Although both Elizabeth Woodville and Lady Jessica are very similar in that they see their families destroyed and works to use their influence to build it back up again. They both have magical abilities involving water as well. But that does not mean Henry VIII is going to become a worm monster. I don't know how much more I can get out of this time period without repeating myself since most of the events and people keep overlapping. So if I do cover Margaret Beaufort, it's likely to be another one and done video much like this. And that was Elizabeth Woodville. Yeah, honestly, I don't know how much else I can get out of this time period, although I have summarised the events of the Wars of the Roses from the perspective of the York side three times now. So maybe if I did Margaret Beaufort, it would change things up a little. I think I'll leave the Wars of the Roses subjects to my patrons because oddly enough when I've asked my patrons to choose something the majority choice has always been Wars of the Roses subjects. Very interesting that. Although it can't possibly be Wars of the Roses with the next choice. Let's have a look at that poll because I haven't actually looked at it for a while. So the choices were for four different famous pieces of literature by four famous authors. So it was Hamlet by William Shakespeare, Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, or Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. And Pride and Prejudice was the one that won that poll. So 
when I next get the chance, I will be covering 10 different Pride and Prejudices. And oh my God, yes, I was just remembering that Donald Sutherland will be featured in that. R.I.P. Donald Sutherland. He touched our lives in a great way. First time I saw him in anything was that Kate Bush music video, Cloud Busting. That is going to mean so many different things now. I'm a bit sentimental because I've been having Prosecco. And as I'm doing this outro, we have two new dramas to talk about because Firebrand has probably been released everywhere by now. And also there's that Lady Jane series. I really don't want to watch that one. The, ter the trailer was terrible. Maybe things will turn around and I will really like it like I did with Rain, but Rain is one of those things where I don't think lightning will strike twice. Your handling of events is strange and wrong, but the acting is amazing. I don't think we're going to get that with Lady Jane. But I'm going to wait for the entire season of Lady Jane to come out, and then I will bitch about it. And then either I will do a vlog series, or I will just do a bunch of reactions like I did with Blood, Sex and Royalty. But it's really not looking good, I really don't want to watch it. I get to delay it for at least eight weeks. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. Before we go, I have to thank my patrons who support my channel. These are amazing people. The best thing about patrons is they do support this channel financially and help me keep my head above water because you can never predict what the ad revenue on YouTube is like for every month because one month it might be okay and there'll be like £200 coming in. Other times it'll be like, no, you're only getting barely 60 quid. So the patrons on my channel do an amazing job in supporting me. You do get benefits from supporting the channel in return, like access to a Discord server, early access to scripts and videos that I make, as well as being able to vote in future projects. And I also must thank the King and Queen patrons, the highest level contributors, Alison Cuff, Anna from Gustine, Annalise Barnett, Jill Minero, Larissa and Leslie Williams. In regards to paid members on Patreon, I do have a set goal where if I reach 50, I will cover Elizabeth II. But at the moment, I'm struggling to get above 30. So even if some of you just join at the Lord and Lady, where you just get access to the Discord and your name in the credits of practically every video I do, then that can help us towards that goal. And you might then see the Elizabeth II coverage. That will probably be a one and done project like this, but still, it's an interesting thing to think of. That includes both adaptations of the BFG, but I will also have to watch The Crown, so pray for my soul. But yeah, those are two videos you can look forward to, the Catherine de' Medici rankings and the Pride and Prejudice hot takes. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share this video around because engagement with this video is so very, very important when fighting the algorithm.